Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are continuing on with the life of Elijah. And uh, last time we saw him predict a drought, which came about, and um, and because of that, there are obvious consequences for that. And it's not just um, and it's not just the country of Israel, but it's the surrounding places as well. So, if you would, turn back to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to go to verse 8, and we're going to do the whole chapter. So, we're going to meet this woman that has a son and um, basically gives Elijah room in her in her place. So, because, again, he's been fleeing from, not directly from Ahab and Jezebel, but it's kind of implied, right, uh, knowing that, a, uh, that he told Ahab that this drought was coming because of what Ahab has done. So, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So it's interesting, first off, I want to pause here. It's interesting, first off, to see where he is going, and that is to Sidon. Um, Sidon, if you recall our little background into uh, King Ahab in chapter 16. Uh, Sidon should jump out at you, uh, not because of Ahab, but because of Jezebel. So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. Sidonians. Uh, is it possible that this is a different Sidon than is mentioned in 1 Kings 16? Yes, it's possible. But is it more likely that's the same? I think so. And so it's interesting that in his fleeing from King Ahab, he goes to the hometown of Jezebel. And at the hometown of Jezebel, he does some miraculous things. And I think that's a great, again, the Lord's irony, right? I mean, I just, what a great, um, again, what a great passage uh, this is, the life of of Elijah. So with that, I just, I had to give that little piece of background. Uh, It seems awesome to me that, that that was in there. So, however, it's also a big ask that Elijah gives to um, to this widow, uh, somebody that is often in uh, biblical times thrown to the outside of societies would would be widows, and yet during a drought he asks he asks her for water, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, does this seem rude? Does this seem just kind of mean of Elijah to ask for this thing. I mean, obviously he must be thirsty, so no, but at the same time, it does seem like a weird first request instead of, hey, can I have shelter? Can I have food? Um, Let's just talk. No, he asked for water, and I think it is a test to see um, who this woman is. What is her character? And it's interesting um, to see how she responds in verse 11. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of of bread in your hand. So not only was she going to get the water, but now um, he wants food as well. In verse 12, and and she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So it's just a very sad situation. And it's one that if you're thinking to yourself, if I'm Elijah, and and I'm in his position. I'm hearing the sad story, knowing that this drought was in part because of my prediction. Obviously, it was brought about by the Lord, right? But you probably feel a little sentimental, which 
that's the case with Elijah here. And uh, end in his response, verse 13. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and, her, and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, it's it's so cool to see how the Lord works. And so first off, he sends Elijah to the homeland of Queen Jezebel, who's Actions have caused a lot of the the pain that the Lord is feeling, right? And yet he sends his prophet to her hometown, and in her hometown there is a widow and her son that are just pretty much days from death, and yet he works in this miraculous way. Uh, and Elijah, just the, just the, just the the encouragement that he gives to her, not only with the promise of the flour not being spent, of the oil uh, not being spent. Um, yes, that's encouraging in itself, right? But it's this sort of like a command in verse 13, do not fear. Um, he, again, it's not like, oh, don't be afraid. You'll be fine. Get over it. No, it's not that. It's, hey, look, It'll be okay. So don't don't fear what's going to happen next because my God's going to take care of you. And that's what he does. And it's cool to see, too, that it's not just for the rest of the day, but it's throughout the whole entire drought or what's left of the drought period that he will take care of this widow um, and her son. However, that continues to go on, but even in a more miraculous way. So verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And now we're not given what illness this is. Um, we're not sure, but it's just an illness that there's no cure for. There, There's nothing that can be done. And so the widow says to Elijah, verse 18, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my son to remembrance, or, sorry, bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the, cha into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And it's interesting that in verse 18, it's interesting that she that she mentions this. It's not necessarily that she's blaming Elijah, but it's almost like she's blaming God, but it's interesting to see that she says, you have come to bring, you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and cause the death of my son. So it's interesting that she's making this connection between her past sin and the death of her son. Now, we're not given any details on that. Um, we, we don't know, um, we we don't know what exactly she has done. Uh, it doesn't really give us a ton of background into this widow, just that she is a widow. Um, so we're not entirely sure um, what her background is. But she's making this connection, which sometimes, and this is a good point to talk about this, sometimes our sins do have consequences to them um, that, those consequences are why we go through hard times. That is totally, totally true. However, there are times where we're going through hard times that aren't connected to our sins, but yet it's so often, it is so tempting to do that because we think, oh, well, I must have let God down. And so he's, and so he's um, kind of like, he's acting out against me. It's so easy to think that way but but my thing is don't don't feel that way 
Now, yes, obviously there are some circumstances where your sins cause uh, consequences, and that is true. But that's not always the case. And so when something bad happens to you, don't just assume that it is because of your sin. Sometimes it is just because that is what was deemed to be in your path, in your walk of life, to, and to see how you would respond to it. Uh, the Lord wants to see how you would respond to it. Um, that, for me, that's something that I really had to wrestle with. As a new believer, I just assumed that whenever something bad happened to me, it was connected to something that, I, oh, what have I, what did I do? What, what, what did I do now? Um, and I had to really walk through that. Uh, so that that's something that's interesting. I, you don't really think about with this passage too much. And this passage, honestly, isn't really thought about too much anyways with Elijah. You typically think about um, him being fed by the ravens, or you typically think about the Mar Mount Carmel, um, the Mount Carmel contest between the prophets of Baal, which we'll get to, uh, which we'll get to next week. Uh, but you don't typically think about this interaction between this widow and Elijah. And so th there's a lot here to be learned. So he gets he gets her he gets her son and he goes up to the upper chamber where he was. Um and so then he cries out to the Lord in verse 20. And Elijah cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? So Elijah is making this connection um, that he knows that this has been allowed. Uh, and he's trying to figure out why. Why is that? Uh, because she has opened his arms to him. Uh, she has embraced him and allowed him to stay with her in this this great kindness and the thing that she gets in return is the death of her son who she loves doesn't seem to add up for Elijah. Uh, but again, that's because he's thinking in his own terms and not what the Lord has in mind. Verse 21, then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So, for me, I think this is just the reason why this was allowed, the death of the son, um, the the grief of uh, of the widow who's already lost her her husband, and so she's already scraping by. Her son means everything to her, and she ends up losing him. And in this moment of grief, she begins to experience grief, which again is totally is totally understood, right? And yet it gives her this moment to know who the Lord is for certain. And I love this explanation by her in verse 24. And so for me, it almost seems like she knew who Elijah was. Um, they probably had talked after eating that meal and obviously the whole thing with the, the jar, the jars not filling out uh, or never being empty probably would start to, I wonder who this is, right? Right. It would be like, huh, this guy's interesting. <laughs> but for me, it, it would be, I think it's interesting because I think she maybe had doubts on who he was, on who Elijah was, but I think she had doubts on who the Lord was too. And yet in this one moment where he not only fills up the jars, but now he brings, meaning the Lord, but now the, but now the Lord brings her son back to life. That's the thing that makes her go, oh my goodness, this, this man is a man of God, uh, and uh, being Elijah, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So that to me is such a great statement. The word of the Lord 
when we as believers are proclaiming the gospel, the word of the Lord is truth, and we should always hang on that. Um, so with that being said, this is a passage that isn't really talked about very much, and yet I love it because it shows not just about Elijah serving somebody or about the Lord raising um, this widow's son from the dead, but it's about trusting in the in the word of the Lord as truth. That's what uh, the widow sees at the end of it all, which is so it's it's kind of interesting because in chapters 18 and 19, Elijah is about to go up against the prophets of Baal who don't believe that the word of the Lord is truth. And yet because of that, because Elijah believes that is true, he faces victory in Mount Carmel in chapter 18, but then he faces doubt and he faces um, anxiety in chapter 19 when he is being basically pursued by Queen Jezebel and the soldiers um, to kill him, basically. And he basically has to get down to the boy, is the word of the Lord truth? And it's interesting that it starts here with a widow um, seeing that the word of the Lord is true, and then it will really come together when Elijah has to put that together for himself in chapter 19. So we'll get to that next week, though. So I don't want to spoil everything, but we'll get to that next week. So, uh, but I will see you with Robin Word tomorrow, and then we will tackle uh, Elijah and Mount Carmel uh, next week. Thanks.